Welcome to Bunker Town. This week, we have a special guest on the show joining us to talk about the Wells Fargo Championship. We preview the AT&T Byron Nelson and even get into a little trivia competition. Let's get right into it. Oh boy, look where he's hit it. This is serious. This is hard to watch. You know, building sand castles in the, in the sand. What happens is you have this sense of embarrassment. That's a shake. He decided to re tee. That's a shake. Oh man. But I'm surprised he missed hit it that badly. Wow. All right, welcome to Bunker Town, your favorite players, Caddy's favorite podcast. We're super excited to be kicking off our first episode here, where myself and the rest of the foursome will be giving you weekly content on mostly what's happening in the golfing world, and less importantly, what's going on in our lives. My name's Zach Penser. To give you guys a little bit of a background, I've been involved in the golf community for several years now, tweeting about it blogging about it. That's how I first got started, was in the accounting business. Couldn't have hated my job more and decided, why not just start a golf website that goes out to absolutely nobody? But along the way, you know, I was tweeting, trying to get viewers, maybe uh, one or two a a blog until I started posting more provocative blogs. And then those started really to pick up. That's probably how our guy Reed Reed got interested. But uh, from there, started tweeting wanted to come up with a podcast. And then I happened to uh, run into my pal Nolan, who he's now the first introduction of the show. Yeah, man, we met online just like any happy marriage does. And it was beautiful. It was a beautiful moment. Um, man, it's been it's been a nice, fun ride. I love golf. I love chatting up with you guys every week. Um, and I'm just happy to be here. Happy to uh, be hanging out with the foursome. Um, I'm an avid golfer myself here in Oregon, uh, get some good, good golfing weather. So I can't complain too much about it, but Hey, I just remember going back. I saw Zach needed a tiger blogger. So I slaved away, worked for free on his website, writing tiger articles. And, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a match made in heaven. And here we are now it's brought me to bunker town and, wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Uh, I think of myself as a pretty good golfer, but uh, we got one other guy definitely on the foursome who could kick my butt, ex-caddy, Mr. Reed Martin. Golf's played a part of all of our lives, man, but uh, I started playing at six years old up in Seattle, and it's kind of led me throughout my whole life uh, playing competitive junior golf, collegiate golf at UCF, uh, Assistant pro at a golf course, caddying on tour, LPGA, PGA tour, Corn Ferry tour, uh, with players such as Mark Hubbard, uh, Ryan O'Toole on the LPGA, um, who you may know. Um, and, uh, you know, it's golf is, has led me to meet these guys, uh, met these guys, uh, actually at the Greenbrier. I was, came across a caddy who's a good friend of mine and, and has been a former guest on our podcast, Colton Heisey as well, uh, who, linked us together um you know i came on for a guest for a little while and they ended up needing a uh another guy to supplement the group and so i came on and joined them and it's been uh i don't know it's been a couple of years now huh been a couple of years yeah we've been we've been doing this this thing for a while and then we added a new member uh i should have mentioned i'm i'm in toronto reads in columbus but luckily i got one other canadian on the show who could pronounce words correctly clearly it's stark yeah, I guess, you know, I'm that weird guy that goes to the course by himself and joins a threesome. And then at the end of 18 holes, you become uh, best friends. So I'm glad to be joining you guys. Uh, super excited. Love golf. Golf obsessed. Uh, complete golf nerd. I uh, have a big sports background with baseball and hockey. But I re- quickly realized that golf is, has been my passion uh, uh, post playing any other competitive sport. Um, and to be able to talk about it with you guys every week from PGA, what's going on there to my weekly rounds out in uh, 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 just getting out onto the course now in Toronto. Uh, I'm super excited to be joining you guys. Yeah, we, we got to get like a Bunker Town tournament going, I think. I'm, I'm definitely going to need the most strokes. I think, I don't know. I think, I hope Reed is, is the best. Reed, I know you are, you're the only one of us who's chasing the competitive dream. You worked on the PJ tour. Now you're chasing the dream as a player yourself. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a different 
uh, different side of the ball, you can call it. Um, you know, I'm facing it on the logo now, not the Pro V1 7 symbol, but uh, if you call it that way. But uh, yeah, trying to chase some Monday qualifiers, Corn Ferry Tour. Um, you know, I'm thankful I have uh, have some sponsors here out in uh, Columbus, Ohio, at a golf course called the uh, North Star Golf Club. Uh, just went private January 1st. If you ever get the chance to play or in Columbus, hit me up. Uh, beautiful golf course. Only two holes have houses on them. Whole bunch of nature, deer everywhere. I uh, just saw three or four babies out there today, running around. But uh, anyhow, yeah, sorry to get away from that. But I like to post post North Star in there. They've done a lot of uh, good for me and help help for me. And uh, check it out if you're in town. Hit me up. But uh, yeah, it's uh, golf is now. Uh, we actually hit the road for Kansas City next Saturday. Uh, like this coming Saturday, I guess is more it is. Um, and, uh, to Knoxville chasing some Mondays, trying to get to the dream, man. I've, uh, grinding away every day and out of the golf course, 10, 12 hours a day. I can respect that immensely, Reed. I myself, you know, tried playing competitively to some extent, played in high school, um, my senior year and then tried to walk on at college. Um, I knew, I knew academics was always going to be like, my main focus but you know i thought it'd be so cool to be say hey yeah, i made it division one as a golfer couldn't quite make it and just to see how good those guys were and how much better you are than them and um it's just immense how deep the world is in terms of golf and we had you know a great guest on um coming and he is top tier golfing right um, it's crazy how much time and effort it takes to be that good and to perfect your craft that much in anything, uh, let alone golf, a sport that just drives us daily golfers mad. Reed, you know what? I, I can compare with you quite a bit, actually, in the competitive golf world. I, I actually am a former Sea uh, Flight champion <laughs> at my uh, at my course, Trafalgar Golf and Country Club, RIP to Trafalgar. But uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a tense Sunday. I was able to still pull off the victory with a, I think I was somewhere in the mid 80s. So you know, same level as you, I'm assuming, right? Hey, C's get degrees, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, when you mentioned the guest we have on, a little a little tease, not giving that away right away. Although if you're listening to this, you'll probably just see it in the title. So but we are going to try to have guests on almost every week. We we know some big names in the golf community from caddies, players, personalities, star athletes who just happen to play golf and we should have some great interviews coming, some great previews coming, but that's really the goal of our show to entertain and inform along the way. I will tell you one thing, Zach, there are some people that we've had on in the past that will be on again that uh, not necessarily are professional golfers, but they have golf stories that will make you laugh and make you think about it every time you think about golf. I mean, those are some of the best stories. I, I'm not the best golfer, but I feel like I have very good golf stories. Like my personal claim to fame is that I am willing to put up any amount of money that I could make you shoot five shots worse than your handicap just through my <laughs> mental like torture that I will put on you while you're on the course. My only rule is you're not allowed to touch the guy golfing, but you could talk in the backswing. You could do whatever. Fine by me. That's what we're trying to bring, right, to the podcast world. I mean, we got Reed the stick. We got Nolan, the guy who thinks he's a stick. He's not. <laughs> we got Stark, who's going to be your best buddy the whole time. We got Zach, who's going to make you feel really good about your golf game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We cover all the bases, and that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to, you know, be professional, get some cool golf insights, but also have some fun and uh, just joke around and really just, you know, have a good time on here. We're, we're, we're here for each and everyone's enjoyment. We're trying to have a good time and uh, make this something fun for everyone. Not to mention every week, a few of us will be picking some winners for the PGA events coming up. So make sure you tune into that, too, because we got uh, what we believe are the right picks to win you some cash. Yeah, that's that's really that might be our specialty here. Am I? That might be where we really set ourselves <laughs> apart. There might be a few of you degenerates out there who just fast forward to that segment every week. So, <laughs> and I'll be the, I'll be the guy sitting here who tells you what kind of grass is on the golf course because that's what interests me. Yeah, Reed gives the deep insight into the course and then just put in who he thinks is going to play real well, trying to act like he's not betting on this guy. That's. <laughs> Nolan, though, you're you're the huge Tiger guy of the group. I mean, I think all of us, safe to say, we all love Tiger. But Nolan, that's your guy. You bring the stats. I feel like every single course, you're just going to have 
something about Tiger to relate it to? He's so easy to, you know, bring up and he is the golfing world, right? Like, uh, like you said, like I might be the Tiger guy, but we're all the Tiger guy. There's, there's no golf personality out there that you like more than Tiger or won't want to talk about Tiger or, I mean, when he's not even playing, he's the topic of conversation. Um, we can get into it a little bit later on what, what's happening with Tiger this week because there's always something. But, hey, I mean, a lot of us will go back and be like, yeah, Tiger's what got me into golf. The the 97 Masters or the 2000 run, the Tiger Slam, the red and black. I mean, he was just breaking down barriers like crazy. And you couldn't not watch this guy play golf. He was doing things no one else could do. Players were like worshiping at his feet. It was something to watch. And he's, he's defeated father time already. I'm really hoping he can just do it one more time for us all. Uh, one more send off for the goat. No. And you, uh, you said something there that kind of spiked my interest. There's uh, a lot of young players coming up and up and coming, you know, trying to match tiger and kind of from tiger's era when they were young, I'll be interested to talk to Paul and I will, we can ask Paul about, you know, what those young players look like and why they're so good nowadays. This past week, the PGA Tour saw another first-timer join the winner's circle as Wyndham Clark had a week to remember, holding off Xander Schauffele to take it at 19 under par. We're going to get into all of it, but before we do, I'd like to introduce a very special guest, someone you might be familiar with, a legend on the course. He was on the bag for several players, most notably Vijay Singh, Webb Simpson, and now works with up-and-coming superstar Cameron Young. Who better to join us? For our, this segment, than someone who is at the event, Paul Tesori, welcome to the show. What a great introduction. I appreciate that. That's uh, some good stuff. I heard the word legend in there, so you had me. I'm ready to go now. You are an absolute legend. 23-time <laughs> winner, I think. I think Man, that's... 25. 25 of them. Come on. <laughs> Paul, you got to update the LinkedIn then. Yes, exactly. I need to. There you go. I'll do that uh, as soon as possible. I'll tell you what. Legend's an understatement, man. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that, boys. I appreciate that. That's very kind. I mean, you've been to the mountaintop, the U.S. Open winner, Ryder Cup, President's Cup, multiple times. What is that like, you know, reaching the peak of the peak? Like, as a golfer, they're the 99.9 percentile, and as a caddy, you're the 99.9 percentile. Like, none of us get to experience that in our fields. I mean, what is that? Do you get to reflect on that? at all you know as you as you've been going through the years i mean now you're like restarting with the rookie of the year yeah tell us a little bit about uh, that it's kind of weird i think we can all feel that way in sports you know growing up obviously this wasn't the goal uh to be caddying on the pga tour it was to play on the pga tour and um i had a pretty good college career and then got my card right out of college and i wanted to play and unfortunately uh my body and my mind didn't quite allow the physical skills to succeed on tour. So um, it led me into kind of like this 2.0, so to say, uh, what I was going to do the second part of my career. And I've been very, very fortunate. Any caddy will tell you that as good as you can do, all the right things that you can say, all the psychology that you can use, it still comes down to one thing, and that is your player playing great golf. So I've been very fortunate to work for some incredible players um, and experience some things that, yeah, like you said, uh, that, you know, most people would never get to experience. And even myself, um, you know, I never looked at a career that would be either absent from a major championship or players or a Ryder Cup or President's Cup. But um, looking back now, as I'm getting a little older, you can kind of appreciate all the uh, things I've been able to do. And um, like I've said before, and, you know, there's a couple opportunities I wish I could have taken away uh, and not done, hence the, the Tiger Who story, which a lot of people know. But then, you know, there's so many hard losses that I think I remember those um, probably even more so sometimes in the wins. Paul, tell us a little about, I mean, I, I've experienced a little bit, but for those who don't, who don't know, tell us a little bit about the in the moment. Like you're coming down the stretch and on Sunday in a golf tournament, the pressure, you know, 
on you as a caddy to perform. I mean, it's performing in a different way, but you got to perform and, and, you know, make the right calls and the call offs and whatever, um, and be able to, uh, respond with your player, you know, back and forth in a, in a sense that's effective. Um, how does that bond get, you know, stronger between the players and how does that grow and how long does it take and whatnot? Yeah. What a great question. Um, so much of it depends on who you're working for. Um, I remember my days with Veej. I mean, when you spoke, you better be sure that you are accurate in what you were speaking. It needed to be quick. It needed to be concise. It needed to be factual. And then the big one is it needed to be correct. Um, and so I felt a lot more pressure with VJ to be correct, to be on, because if I wasn't, it wasn't the fact that in the moment something would happen, it would just carry on a little bit longer. When you were wrong with him, he just had a harder time getting past it. Um, my last boss, 12 and a half years, uh, Weber, very, very different, um, very free to speak my mind. Um, I could be as bold as I wanted at any time. And there was really no, no there were no no's, which is such a freeing thing to be able to do as a caddy. Um, I could say what I wanted, when I wanted, and kind of how I wanted. Uh, Weber was one of those he didn't even mind bringing up. Um, maybe a negative consequence to help him make the right decision. Uh, you know, an example might be, let's say, 18 TPC Sawgrass uh, in between a six and a seven iron. He wouldn't mind me verbalizing, hey, I don't like the hard seven. Obviously, the only tendency we have when we hit it hard is left. Um, you know, our miss here is right. I like the six iron. Let's take 10 off, aim it 10 feet right of it and go. Where that's a very rare thing to be able to do. I definitely haven't done that with Cam yet. We're, we're not that far down the uh, road yet to know uh, how he would respond to that. But, you know, already kind of finding some of those differences. Uh, my first week with Cam, I just purposely asked a lot of questions, allowing him to feed me information, even though I kind of knew him. I just wanted to see how he communicated. Now we've had four, four tournaments under our belt already now. So um, a lot more clarity and kind of what he likes, when he likes. Um, he's kind of an old soul. He's quick thinking. So um, it'll be another guy that I'll be able to be really, really honest uh, under the gun. And thankfully, as a caddy, like I don't carry the same nerves or anxieties I did uh, as a player. Every now and then when you're making a big decision, I still feel that. Um, I think the worst was the year Tiger won the Masters, I think 19. We had a chance to win, and I called Weber off a, a club on the last hole. And uh, I remember him over the ball, and I felt quite nervous. Uh, thank goodness he pulled it and it covered by about a yard, and it worked out. But uh, you know, in, in the moment when you're making a big call like that, you can still feel a little anxious. Paul, I wanted to ask you, I know you said you played college golf, um, and now you're with Cameron Young and, uh, also played college golf at Wake Forest, a little bit different. I want to get your insights on where college golf is now and how these guys are ready. We see it <laughs> in college football, college basketball. These schools are like pro sports. They run them like professional teams. And when they come into the pro sports, they're ready. Uh, as you've now seen the changes over the years, uh, what's it like with these new young guys coming into the PGA from the college game? Are they a little bit more prepared, a little less nerves on the big stage? It's completely different. Um, obviously, I'm going to show my age, but... When I was at the University of Florida in 93 and 94, we won a national championship, finished third the next year. We were ranked one or two in the country the entire time. Uh, conference championships were won by double digits. We were one of the premier programs, and there was no working out. Uh, we would run stadiums if we you know, did something dumb. Uh, that was about all that we would do. There was no gym time. There was none of these other things. And now you look at these golfers and you look at these facilities that they're going through. It's incredible. Um they have full programs, strength training, speed training, uh, endurance training, uh, dietary stuff that they're doing. I mean, you know, there was none of that when I was there. And hence, I mean, when you came out of college, you know, 20 years ago, I'm even going to say 10 years ago, and you just kept your card. That was known as being something really strong. But now these 22 year olds are coming out of college and they're not scared. Uh, they're physically ready and they're mentally ready to compete. I, I still think a lot of people miss out to realize this is all Tiger's generation that we're watching. They all grew up watching him win and thinking that was normal. When we all grew up, we thought if you won twice in a year, you could be player of the year. Um, three times you were guaranteed to be player of the year. Um, it was unheard of. And then, you know, these kids growing up now watch BJ win nine times in 2004. They watch Tiger win nine times, 10 times, eight times, tournaments over and over again, what, 82 times in his career. Uh, and so they think that's normal now. And 
that's what you see. I mean, Wyndham uh, that we just saw win this uh, just yesterday, you know, he hasn't really been in that position at all. And he acted like he had been there a hundred different times. Um, the way he played, the way he competed, how patient he stayed. He didn't have perfect golf. And yet he played as if, again, he was a double digit winner on the PGA Tour. And it just shows nowadays how hard and how deep it is. Uh, I know Cam has said that in a couple of interviews, but you know, your expectations just have to be a little bit different sometimes. Um, you know, you can play as good as you possibly can and still not win golf terms because you have 22-year-olds out of college that are ready to win, and you still got these guys in their late 30s that are ready to go too. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Wyndham, and going on that, when he took home $3.6 million. You've been on tour for a while. You were with some of the greatest players ever. Is it weird that, like, he just won way more at the Wells Fargo than guys were winning for winning the majors. Absolutely. You know, it's incredible to think about one of my good friends, Mike Hicks, who caddied for all, uh, all three of Payne Stewart's uh, majors. Um, he finished second this year at Pebble Beach, which was not um, even an elevated event. And it was the most money he'd ever made in a golf tournament, finishing second at Pebble Beach uh, in a non-elevated event. And so it's incredible to look at that and to see how much money there is uh, in the game and, you know, it's also changed my profession as caddies. Uh, you know, in the last 20 years, it's completely flipped. The IQ of the caddy now is so much higher. The quality of the caddies like golf game. I was one of the top two or three best players pretty much for 10 years, and I'm a plus five now. And I'm telling you, there's probably a dozen guys that are at least that, if not more. Um, a lot of times, you know, college teammates are coming out with them with the technology that we have now and how good our yardage books are, they can kind of close the gap a little bit on experience. Um, they know their players so well, they know what to say, what to do. Reed had mentioned that earlier in his question about what to say and do. And so the whole landscape has changed a lot because there's so much money involved in what we're doing. Um, and I'm not complaining, that's for sure. But yes, it's definitely changed uh, in a good way. You took the words out of my mouth, Bob. I was going to go into uh, a little bit about, I, I believe it's John Inge, right? Who caddies for Wyndham Clark. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, he, and I know he's a damn good player himself. Yes. I mean, he played obviously professional golf for a long time. Very successful. Still is. I mean, he's still in that, you know, plus five range and, uh, you know, really high golf IQ. We were done early on Saturday and I'm still a golf geek, and I watched a lot of the coverage, and uh, John does a terrific job. I would second that. Yeah, so what did you think? You were, you were out on the course this week with Cam, your fourth event, as you mentioned. I get Maybe things didn't go as you wanted, but we see Cam Young is one of the most exciting players on tour. I, I think it was Saturday. He made like five birdies in succession after all a bunch of bogeys, but yeah. what's it like? being on the bag for someone like that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's very, very different. Again, 12 and a half years with Weber. Um, I'm only uh, four events now into this new job with Cam. Um, it's exciting. It's very different. Like you said, a little more, uh, a little more ebb and flow, a little more up and down. Uh, he finished second this week in birdies and finished 59th. Um, and so when you swing at 190 miles an hour, obviously some things are going to happen on occasion that the ball just won't cooperate. And that's just using the, uh, just straight geography or geometry, just realizing, well, if a ball goes on this line, it goes 270, it's okay. If it goes 340, it's not okay anymore. And so, um, you know, he was pretty frustrated. We played poorly at Hilton Head and played poorly um, at Quail. Uh, his frustration's definitely high. You know, he's got two young kids, uh, not sleeping that well. Uh, he doesn't really like being away from the family that much. And so when things aren't going well, he gets a little down. I think that'll be one of my um, biggest kind of, I guess contributions to the team is going to be that aspect of it. Uh, I've been there, helped VJ put together a plan uh, to eventually, you know, overtake number one in the world and put together a process. Webb and I, you know, Webb was 213 in the world when we started and got as high as fourth. And, you know, it's putting together a process, putting together a plan and realizing, okay, let's look at our weaknesses and how are we going to get better at that. And Cam doesn't have that many physical weaknesses, that's for sure. His dad's his coach. They keep it simple. Um, He's got, uh, I'm sure I'm allowed to say he's got huge kahunas. There's no uh, moment that's too big for him. But there are some just kind of, you know, how do we deal with controversy? How do we deal um, when things come hard against us? They're going to come, even in your best of weeks, they're going to come. And how do you deal with those? And I think that uh, we'll come up with a good game plan and, and learn how to do that a little more. We've got a massive stretch coming up, the PGA next week, a week off, then four in a row after that. So, 
a lot of big golf um, uh, coming up, and I think we both want to be really ready and really prepared for a good stretch. Now, I want to take you back, Paul, in 2012, uh, the U.S. Open with Webb Simpson. Um, I just want to get your feeling on when you woke up on Sunday morning, where was your head? What were you thinking? Are you <laughs> are you starting to think ahead just like the golfers do, right? They start thinking ahead what could happen or are you so focused on I got to keep him in the right mind frame and make sure he's focused on the day. That's my main job. Can you not let yourself look ahead? What take us through the morning uh before that round? You know, it's it's such a I've, I've never been asked that question and here it is 11 years later I've never been asked that. But yeah, winning never entered our mind. Never entered my mind didn't really enter his mind either i think we were four back does that sound right uh we were in i think tied for sixth uh we were three groups behind the leaders and webb only did one interview all week when he teed it up on sunday which is incredible to think about um and that was on sunday he, he asked or answered about a couple of questions and what's really interesting is my whole mindset was you know weber had a big year in 2011 but we hadn't really, you know, contended at all in a major. Not hadn't really hadn't. Um, we had a couple like mid-teens finishes uh, the year before, but there wasn't that really thought. My thought was, man, let's get out here. These first six holes are monsters at at the Olympic Club, and let's just get out there. Let's try to keep our feet underneath us, and let's just play a good solid round. You know, get our first top ten in a major, and away we go. And the round it started exactly like I just said. We were two over through five. Um, they're just brutal holes, and you know, the um, when we're on number two, we bogeyed the second hole, which isn't one of the hard one to stretch. And I saw him looking at the leaderboard. I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm just checking. I said, why are you checking? I said, you know, if we're two under at some point today and you look up there and we're leading, it's going to add nerves. And if we're two under at some point today and you look up there and we're four back, you're going to get frustrated and try to press. Neither matters. You're not allowed to look all day today. And who knew what was about to happen? But um, we birdied the sixth hole, got away. It's a really difficult hole, and we hit a six iron and blocked it a little, and it landed just right of the green, kicked down to 12 feet and made it, which was a huge bonus. felt like an eagle. Uh, next hole is a drivable par four, made a regular birdie. And one of the cool stories is number eight there is a par three, and I'd gone out and watched golf for about an hour that morning, and Webb's told the story a few times. I like listening to it because it makes me sound good, but that's beside the point. But uh, I watched three groups come through there this morning, and all three groups to a back left flag had missed the green short, which was 20 yards short, probably a good solid 12 short of where they were trying to land it, so a full club, but 20 yards short of the pin. And none of them had reached it, so I knew something was funny. So sure enough, we get in there, and Weber's on a seven iron. And I just said, buddy, I watched three groups come through here this morning. All of them are short of the green. There's no reason why, but it's a six iron hit it regular. And he was not comfortable. I said, buddy, you have to trust me. Hit a beautiful six iron, pulled it, and still barely covered the corner. So it still went short, jumped on the green, made, a, I don't know, about a 15-footer for birdie, and really set up the rest of the match. And then I watched the coverage later on, and Ernie Els um, flagged a shot just right up. It came up short and rolled 40 yards down the hill, and he made bogey. Um, uh, Graham McDowell flagged it right at it and was 20 yards short, short in the bunker. He might've made bogey as well. So it was a fluke more than anything else, but something was happening on that hole that day. I don't know what it was. We had a little Marine layer came in. It was a little colder that holds uphill. Um, but that kind of kickstarted the rest of the round. And one of my favorite part of the story is, is he, he made that little smelly three footer on the last hole and he comes over and I said, you could look now. And um, I still have the coverage, but you could see him look up on the board and, uh, and, and he kind of got a smile knowing at the time we were probably going to be in a playoff. We did not think we would win out right at that time. Jim was still back on the 16th hole, which they had moved up 110 yards on Sunday. Um, and that actually ended up being the difference. He was uncomfortable there and Jim hit a duck hook made bogey and ended up winning the golf tournament by one. We can't not talk about the 2012 U S open and not bring up the bird man photo bomb at the trophy ceremony. What right. was going, yes. what was going through your head when that guy stepped in front of the camera? Well, this is, uh, I mean, uh, this is just who I am. This doesn't surprise anybody that knows me, but I was already on a red eye. I was already gone. I hugged Webb and said, I'm out of here. I got a chance to catch this red eye. I got to go now. And so I didn't know anything about the bird man until I landed um, in, in Jacksonville and I read all about it. Of course, I liked Webb's quick little quip that he said, enjoy the night in the jail cell, pal, um, which was good. But, you know, one of the kind of weird stories about that that I missed is, you know, Mike, is it Mike Davis? Is that who it was? But he, 
he took him and threw him into the bunker, which I don't think was covered on the screen, but he took him and grabbed him and threw him into the bunker, uh, which Webb got to witness this entire thing. Uh, and none of the rest of us did. And uh, kind of interesting, but, you know, that guy's been famous. He is wrecked. He's gone out into Wimbledon. He's gone out in the British Open. He's gone out into the World Cup. Uh, he's, you know, trying to – an environmentalist. And he ended up writing Webb a long email and apologizing for – kind of stealing the thunder on such a big moment for him. But uh, I think the only thing irritating about it was the next 11 years listening to people do the caca. I mean, literally dozens and dozens of time every week. I think that's the only frustrating part about it. Hey, uh, question for you, Paul, kind of off topic of what we were just talking about, but you look at some guys that have played well in the past and maybe lost, you know, their status and making a resurgence. Let's take Ricky Fowler, um, you know, for example, how hard is it to lose everything like that and then actually bring it all the way back? I mean, how many guys have actually lost it and brought it all the way back? Um, he's inside the top 50 in the world now and, you know, it's kind of making his presence known. Yeah, it's, uh, it's incredible. I mean, hats off, uh, to him. There's only been, um, a couple people that I can think about that actually did. Obviously Stricker did it at least once, maybe twice. Hendrick Stenson did it twice. Stuart Sink, I think, huh? Yeah, Stuart did. Absolutely. Uh, Stuart did, uh, had gone away for a little bit and then came back once his kids got a little bit older and kind of rededicated himself. But I think you kind of have one common denominator and it seems they've all got pretty good positive attitudes anyway. I talked to Ricky several times during that stretch of struggle. Um, and he just kept saying the right things. The whole thing is like, I'm working hard. He's like, it's close. I just can't seem to put things together. And then, you know, we saw once he kind of went back to Butch, um, Butch just has this ability, you know, Webb and I worked with Butch a couple times a year for the last, uh, whatever, six, seven, seven years. And, you know, Butch sometimes wouldn't even say anything, um, about mechanics. It would be just more, uh, kind of a pep talk, like Pops is talking to you and says, you need to quit getting in your own way. You need to go trust what you do. And when he went back to Butch, Butch just kind of returned him back to his MO, kind of his signature, allowed him to get into some positions that he had been in before, and then just kept feeding him the good information, told him, why are you such a bad putter now? You need to start working on your putting again. And that was really, if you go back and look, that was what really left Ricky even more. He was a top 20 putter every year, and that had kind of gone because he was working so hard um, on the rest of his game. And so, um, he's one of the most well-liked guys on the tour. You guys would all love him. He treats everybody the same, treats caddies the same way as he treats other players. Um, he's a tremendous human being. Uh, we all root for him. And I think the scary thing is he's not gotten into the top 50 in the world because of two good weeks. He's playing well every single week. And I mean, I can't think of probably a more popular winner, and it's probably coming at some point soon than Ricky Fowler. Especially the younger age. I mean, all the young kids, man, you look up, see all these head covers on their bags, and it's all Ricky Fowler bright orange, and they're dressing with orange slacks and you know, or the Ricky Fowler Puma hats. And how many times do you see that? Absolutely. And I mean, the game's just better off when Ricky Fowler's playing good golf. There's no doubt. Yeah, I'd say another guy you got to loop into that popularity pool would definitely be a Rory McElroy. Um, he's been kind of up and down in the news a little bit lately. We're kind of wondering, hey, why why did he skip that event? Left $3 million on the table of pit money. Um, came back, Quail Hollow, where he's won before. Did not perform very well, um, I guess, up to Rory's standards. Maybe it's the course, and I, I look at a guy like your guy, and hey, look at this, on the cover of Golf Digest. Look at him. Yeah, look at him. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> that's a Vogue photo right there. Yeah, I know. They, he, he even shaved for him. I mean, he gets that little rap, nappy hair going down here a little bit, but uh, he even shaved for him, so you knew he was wanting to look a little better on that on that cover. I look at a guy like Rory and Cam. They're both bombers, right? Maybe the course just didn't suit them well this week. Um, but what do you what do you think of Rory's um, kind of, you know, it was like Scheffler and Rom and Rory, like the big three were kind of up there. And Rom and Scheffler have definitely had a great start to the year, but we really haven't seen that yet from Roy. Do you think uh, he's going to kind of come out hot here at the PGA? Obviously had a disappointing Masters um, where yeah. a lot of us wanted to see him do well. What do you think of his game? I mean, I think if we just rewind um, to only two tournaments ago for him, so take the Masters and obviously Quail out of the way, but the week before, you know, Cam beat him in a playoff in the semifinals of the match play. Um, I think after four rounds, Cam was 32 under, and I think Rory was 33 under after four rounds, which is, it's, it's sinful how good that, 
that is. I mean, boys, we could go play a scramble around there, and we're all good players, and we'd have a hard time like beating what what they were doing um, at uh, Austin Country Club. It's just not that easy. And then uh, I think the two starts before that was Bay Hill. I think Rory had a chance to bury the last hole, maybe get into a playoff there. And so he's not that far removed from good golf. He has had a lot of stuff going on that they just seem to take their toll a little bit. I do think he's probably a little exhausted right now. I think golf is um, it's frustrating when you're not playing well. And any time you get superstars, that it's hard for them to find a strength when they're not playing well. Um, if you get him back up there sniffing around, you know, that 15th, 10th chance to win, you'll see kind of the fire come back out. You'll see that. And, you know, Quail Hollow, you look at all the winners at Quail Hollow. You've had some repeat winners, obviously, like um, Rory McIlroy's won there three times. But it's a course that doesn't play favorites. It's a lot like TPC Stadium. Um, you know, the course was really built for Rory and for Cam. But even Cam said it this year. He's like, wow. I didn't realize how tight the fairways are for those guys because they hit it so far. They're hitting it through the dog legs and they grew the rough up a little bit more this year. The greens were a little bit firmer. Um, and so it was just a year there. Like if you're, if those two boys are driving the ball, well, no matter where they are, what they're doing, when they can use a driver, which quail they can, they're going to have a chance to win the golf tournament, even though they're both, you know, pretty average putters. Um, if they drive it well, the bad thing is when, again, you're swinging it at 190, if that golf ball's not doing what you want it to, the opposite can be true. Again, just to rewind, Cam, you know, making 17 birdies, the second most in the field and finishing 60th. Um, I didn't look at Rory's round, but he'll be fine. He's got a little stretch of golf coming up that he'll be ready for. And I just think he kind of, it might be good for him to get out of the news for a little bit. Uh, he's been carrying the torch for the tour for quite a bit and let, let JT, let Chef, uh, let Rom, let them answer some of those questions for a while. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if Rory uh, has a chance to win the PGA uh, next week. I want to ask you about one other guy this week who had an amazing week. It was Xander Shoffley. He's now leading the tour in top tens. It's his 11th runner-up finish, though, and seven-time PGA Tour winner, something I've always wondered. Do you think it's more of a trend or just that he's coming runner up and maybe not able to close the deal? Or do you think it's more just fluke coincidence? So I always like to try to look at, you know, how have they done? How has he performed? And you look this week, I think it went 19, 15, 12. Um, so uh, you take Wyndham Clark, who's never won a golf tournament. And if you let Wyndham have a great week and shoot 12 under, he'd have finished tied for second and lost to Xander by three. Xander was my pick this week. I do a little thing uh, for Golf Digest every now and then, the anonymous caddy. I had a good week. Uh, this week, but Xander was uh, was my pick. You're and not the anonymous caddy if you tell uh, if you tell the uh, world you're the anonymous caddy. That might not be good for golf. But well, I don't do it every week. That's not very good. If I just bust myself out with you guys, but you know, it's one of those things. Xander's just that good, and he's that driven, and he works that hard. He has no weaknesses in his game. He's a good driver of the ball. He's a good iron player. He's an incredible chipper and a solid putter. And I, I, I like saying this. He knows why. And I think that's a big aspect. Like he knows why he's good at each area. He doesn't leave any stone unturned. Uh, um, you know, he works constantly and consistently um, with his caddy, Austin and his dad, and they realize why he's good at each section. So he's going to be a guy that's going to be a double digit top, get top 10 guy every year. Um, and nothing surprises me. I'd be shocked if he doesn't win a major this year or next year. But again, the hard part, I mean, you look at Cam had seven top threes in what a 25 tournament stretch, but he didn't lose any of those golf tournaments. The guy shot 19 under at the old course. Um, Eagle, the last hole uh, at the old course, drove the green. The only, I mean, Rory couldn't get home. And, um, and, and Cam, Eagle, the last hole to lose by one. He shot 17 under at Riviera to lose by two. Um, the guy shot 22 under at Detroit. Like, he just is not losing golf tournaments, but it's it's just so deep nowadays. And unless you get hot with the putter, which is something, again, that typically Cam hasn't done. Um, it's just so deep. You have to hope one week that just one guy doesn't go nuts. And um, I think you've seen that with Xander quite a few times, and we've already seen that with Cam. Yeah, th this week obviously was the a designated event. We've seen a few of them now. They've really produced some great golf, some massive leaderboards that I know fans are excited about. And really, that's that's because of Live and and what came about last year and and the changes that the PGA Tour needed to make. Uh, what's the feel around these designated events? Is it is it a major feel? Do the players have a little bit more buzz? Is the 
crowd a little bit more up for the event. Uh, how are you feeling when you're at these events? Did you say 3.6 million? I'm really up for these events. I'm, I'm excited about this. Uh, the players are excited about it. Um, I'm a little bit old school. Um, I kind of like the feel still of having the full field events. I know why they're doing it. Um, it makes complete sense on paper. They, they showed us all of the analytics about how much better it will be for the other events. If it's only 70 for the designated events, the other events before and after will really still excel. Um, and that's one of the biggest reasons why they kept it at 70 for the designated events. And then the second part was sponsors. Um, they're going to try to take care of their biggest sponsors, um, which is what you've seen through some of the designated events that they've chosen. And so, you know, again, if you've got, uh, you know, the top 20 players in the world and let's just say five of them don't play well, you still want them around on Saturday and Sunday. So PGA tour live can go pick them up in the morning. They still can go cover them. And so I know why they did it. I still like the full field. I like that. There's a cut. We had to birdie two of our last three to make the cut at quail. Um, and, that, that feels exciting. Like, you're fired up when you make that cut on the number. At Hilton Head, we did the same thing. We birdied four of our last six to get one inside the cut line. But there's something about fighting for that that we enjoy. Um, I'll miss that a little bit. But, yes, the buzz, the fans, uh, the crowds have been enormous. And, I mean, it does have that feel of being a different event. I uh, stumbled upon a story once. Um, it's, Joe LaCava has been uh, in the news a bit. He's uh, coming off of Tiger's bag going – on to Patrick Cantley's. Uh, and I heard uh, that you have a little uh, story back with Joe when you were with VJ on VJ's bag at the Masters. Um, VJ has, like you were saying, kind of a certain type of caddy he really needs. And that's one is very direct and very, it's almost like he's military, it feels like at some point. Um, and Joe is known as a bit of a jokester out there and uh, likes to push the envelope, I believe. Tell me a little bit. I, I like think it was that. early 2000s at the Masters. I definitely could not do this story uh, justice because I didn't know that it had happened. Um, remember, I'm kind of doing my own thing over here on the side. I didn't know what Joe and VJ were talking about. I had no idea. But I like that you said jokester pushed the envelope. I call pot stir. He definitely likes to take that pot and stir it up a little bit. So, you know, VJ, yeah, he just had uh, some of his rules, and one of his rules uh, were kind of like, hey, I just don't want you talking to other caddies um, and players. I want you by my side. I want you focused. And he knew my personality. Uh, I kind of like to talk and have a good time and, and enjoy that. I'm ready to work hard and focus as well. But in between shots, it's a long, long day, especially around that place. But anyway, so we get paired with Freddie Couples, and I tell Freddie and Joe, hey, boys, let you know, I can't talk today. Good luck. Play well. You know, have fun. Well, probably not a smart idea on my part. So Joe now has taken it upon himself as soon as I walk off the tee box. Polly, how you doing? How's the family doing? You been playing any golf? Uh, where are you staying this week? Oh, where is that at? Where are you eating? He just starts on the whole time. And VJ's pretty smart. I mean, he kind of figures out, like, I think he's, he's doing this on purpose. So... DJ gets the second shot. Joe gets the divot, walks it back to me, and he goes uh, and just starts, you know, talking some more and more. So, um, I'm those to me. VJ walks over to Joe and says, hey, bro, you need to leave my man alone, all right? And I'm definitely going to clean this up. But Joe looked at Beej and said, you need to go on the other side of the green before I drop you. Something along, like, along those lines or whatever. And, and VJ smiled and said, you couldn't handle me. And Joe said, VJ, he goes, you might talk a big game, but you have none. Something like that. And again, if you ever have a chance to get either John Wood or Joe LaCava, they'll tell, go a little deeper into the story um, than I have. But yes, Joe uh, obviously is in the Caddy Hall of Fame. He's an incredible uh, caddy. He's a great statesman. Um, he's one of those guys. He's not too big for anybody. Um, he's always been kind. He still asks me about my family every time I see him. When we won the players in 2018, I hopped in my car afterwards, and most people knew how much that meant to me. I'm a hometown boy here, and there was a note, and he had a chance to win. And so, uh, thank goodness he left a note for me telling me congrats. Wow, that that's an amazing way to to close things out here with that kind of story. Uh, Paul, I just want to thank you for your time. But before we let you go, I know you do have something close to your heart, a foundation you started in 2009. And I know I want to give you a chance to talk about that. Let our listeners know. Yeah, thanks. So the Tesori Family Foundation, you can check us out, tesorifamilyfoundation.org. But 
it's near and dear to me and my wife's heart. Uh, 13 years we've had it now, um, been able to raise over $2 million that we've given back to local communities. And now we have these all-star kids clinics that we do for 25 kids with special needs. Um, we do one-on-one -on -one instruction with PGA Tour players, caddies, and coaches. We've done 40 with over 1,000 kids that have run through. And my son Isaiah was born with Down syndrome in 2014. And we just love kind of marrying golf and the special needs community. And anything we can do to give back, we love. But um, it's definitely our favorite thing to do. And uh, we can't be more thankful for all the help that we've gotten. That's incredible. Well, thanks so much, Paul. The the anonymous golfer, a legend to the community. We, <laughs> we might have to hit you up for some of those anonymous tips out there because we got we got to be winning those bets. But I doubt I get asked to do it again after I just outed myself. So yeah, hopefully <laughs> thanks, they don't boys. come for us. Thanks, Paul. I know it. Thanks, thanks, Paul. Thanks, thanks, Paul. Thanks, guys. This week, the tour heads to Dallas for the AT&T Byron Nelson, where K.H. Lee is going to be looking to three-peat after winning each of the last two years. Lee has won with scores of 25 and 26 under par, so I think suffice to say we're going to see lots of birdies. Reed, is that fair? Are we going to see more birdies this week? Maybe a new course record? You know, it's funny because you look at TPC Craig Ranch, and it's actually – I never um, played there as a junior golfer, but there was a, a, a junior series that went through TPC Craig Ranch, and every time it was a, it was an elevated event. I call it an elevated event for the juniors back then, and it always played tough. But this course is like 7,400 yards, right? Um you know, it's a Tom Weiskopf design, um, so you're going to get a lot of gentle rolling fairways. Um, you know, I think being longer is why it is ranked one of the toughest courses in Texas. But these guys tend to just eat it up, and uh, I think a lot of it comes with, um, you know, it is long, but you got to remember you're in Texas, and you get some rolling fairways and a little firmer. You know, the ball tends to move a little bit. Uh, on the ground and so you know they'll have, they'll have some mid irons and shorter irons in that that uh you know those guys are you know you get them inside 160 170 and it's uh they can pretty much hit it where they want and so i think that's why you see some of the lower scores there you know it's uh, a 7400 yard golf course in the north plays different than a 7400 yard golf course in the south in texas you know firm and rolling and not you know hitting you know plush grass that's just kind of taking all the speed out of the golf ball per se but um, they have, uh, have bent greens up there. So you're going to get some true, true greens, good putters, uh, good putters will succeed there. Uh, bent grass has always been my favorite. That's what I grew up on. Um, but bent grass, I believe personally, it ro rolls the truest to any, any grass you can find on the surface. Um, Zoysia fairways, if you're hitting fairways, um, you know, the, the Zoysia fairways are going to prop it up. I mean, I know we have, a, we all know how Zoysia is and, if you're in the fairway on Zoysia, it's kind of propping it up on a tee per se. Um, so good iron players that are hitting fairways off the tee will um, will definitely succeed. Um, you know, I don't think you need someone who bombs it. I know it is 7,400 yards. Uh, the par threes are a little longer. Um, you know, they're 220, 230, 240. So somewhere in that range, most of them. Um, and so you're going to, you know, that's where a lot of the length is added. You know, they're not having 190 par threes or 180 par threes. It's all 220, 230, 240. And so, uh, I think you get some of the added length to the total length on those par threes and you don't really add too much to the rest of the golf course for a typical. So I think someone who you don't really need to hit that far I and mean, it is what I'm gathering here. Um, uh, AKA KH Lee from last year, um, doesn't really move it that much, but you know, it hits, it hits it good, but uh, if you're looking at statistical uh, features on tour, he's not that crazy in driving distance. Um, so, yeah, I, I would focus on someone who is a good iron player and someone who rolls the rock because you're on bent grass. And that's, uh, you know, if, if you're playing on bent grass and Zoysia fairways, that's your recipe right there. You said it plays longer in the north than the south of Texas. There's certain grasses that play firmer than other grasses, uh, and and there's certain climates that play firmer than other climates. So 7,400 yards in, let's say, uh, St. Louis is not going to be the same as 7,400 yards in Dallas, Texas, or wherever we want to talk about. It. You know what I mean? It's just 
what it is. But yeah, but I was going to ask Reed, like, you know, when you're caddying your players out there, does that even make a difference that last time you played here, it was a par five and now it's a 495 yard par four? Or do you still play the hole the exact same, just whatever, instead of a birdie, now it's a you par? You know, people get, people, you know, and you can talk to any golfer that goes out and plays, right? You can talk to Joe Schmo that goes and plays around. And they always get fed up, or not fed up, but caught up if it's a par five or par four or par three. Well, my fucking objective is to get the ball in the hole as quick as possible. I don't care what par it is. Like, that's just, I mean, so who cares what par it is? It doesn't make a difference, but people get hung up on it. That's so true. That's so true, man. Like, we care about so much, like, making a par or something like that. Like, then why are there par fives that are reachable in two and par fives you can't get to in two? Like, I mean, oh, yeah. who cares? Then make the wedge, like... Like, I mean, like, I don't, under, I don't understand, but, uh, one thing I was going to say about the golf course that I completely forgot about, I was reading about Weisskopf stuff and, you know, kind of, um, honing some of my detailed knowledge, we'll call it on Weisskopf designs, but he, there was a, there was a quote in there that I found really interesting. And I thought about a lot of Weisskopf golf courses and it's so true. He said, I may not give you access to every pin, but I'll give you access to the middle of the green every time. Spieth would be a popular pick here because he's going to make those 25 footers, right? That you're you're getting a lot of those on a Weisskopf design where you can get to the middle of the green and have a 25 footer every hole. 100% good putters in on bent grass, man. Yeah, dude. I like that insight a lot. And it probably makes me want to change my picks, but I already wrote them down. So I might be in trouble. <laughs> Well, no, and you just you just mentioned Jordan Spieth. Obviously, big story breaking today, just before we're recording. Jordan Spieth out of the event, suffered an injury. Tough news, Stark. What what are your thoughts on the Spieth withdrawal? Yeah, I'm hoping that this is kind of a little bit of uh, just a maintenance week for him. Uh, obviously, the PGA Championship next week. Uh, he's looking to to add to those major titles and. I think he's probably thinking, you know what, Jordan, now's the time to rest, uh, start focusing in on what's really important, which is the majors. Uh, we know that he he's he's looking to win every single one of those ones, and, and it's important for him to play well. I think all the players going into an event like this, although, yeah, they're trying to win the tournament and, and, and uh, win the money and the FedEx points, they're looking ahead to next week. How can you not? You want to be playing well going into the majors and and you want to make this cut. You want to play good on the weekend and have a good good finish. But really, you want your A game come Monday morning when you get to the PGA Championship. I think that's the main focus for this field this week. Yeah, so without speed now, just three of the top 20 players are going to be here. We got Scheffler, Hatton, and Tom Kim. They'll all be looking to go low, but we've had some very unique winners at this event. That's for sure. I mean, obviously, KH Lee back-to-back. We got Jason Duffner winning. We got Sang Moon Bay, Sung Kang, and everyone's favorite golfer, Stephen Bowditch. I mean, how's that for a one-time winner? Hey, I will say, though, Zach, uh, you brought up a name there that really, I'll say, spiked my interest. Tom Kim, and I, I said January 1st or around that time frame, I said Tom Kim might win a major this year. Ooh. He hasn't really he hasn't really showed his uh, presence that he showed in the fall where he won, but uh, that guy can hit a golf ball. Um, I think we see lots of valleys and peaks uh you know from kind of riding the wave in the pga tour um but that guy's gonna win he's gonna win soon he's incredible i couldn't agree more earlier this year he had the quadruple bogey and then came back to win so guy with mental chops like that that's someone that you look out for to win i think it's safe to say guys who win this event obviously you got to be a birdie maker we just spoke to paul a guy like cam young he might have shot 40 under at this event if he was playing his best but I think good putters, good approach game. I think like Reed said it perfectly, the distance may be kind of overblown because of how long the part threes are. Yeah, the field's a little weird this week too, not, especially with speed dropping out. It's uh, There's Scheffler, right? And it kind of tapers off really quickly after maybe a couple guys. So, um, I mean, what kind of what we saw at Mexico, you know, what will happen will... It'd be the two top dogs uh, battling it out on Sunday like Rom and Finau did, or is one of these guys like a KH Lee going to pull through? Um, it's tough to say. Tough to say for sure. There is one other big name in the field, Jason Day, 
former winner, but not the same, not the same course, same event. So, I mean, not really worth much, but he's been trending upwards. He's been searching for a win. This is the exact thing I always say for these guys who haven't won in a while. Enter these events with a worse field. It's your chance to get a win. Hey, Jay Day, uh, that could be a future get for a little podcast. Uh, Jay Day is uh, here in Columbus, and his kids actually play the PGA Junior League at uh, my golf course. Are you better than the kids? Well, they're like nine. I mean... I stand by my question. <laughs> I'll ask you this, Zach. Are you better than their kids? No chance. <laughs> Jason Day's nine-year-old kid could 100% smoke me on the course. I don't even have to see the kid play. <laughs> his, uh, not to get, not to give too much insight, and if we ever get Jason on, we'll let him talk about it. But his, he has a, um, like a, no, it's not a barn, but it's like a built building on his property. He has three different types of grasses that he grows greens on, one being the grass straight straight from Augusta. Oh, that's amazing. That's dedication. There was just like a YouTube video feature on it I saw, too. It was unbelievable. Made me think, too. He's one of those guys who obviously is not from the Ohio area, but uh, that's where he lives and stays and practices, where most people go to these warm climates, so they have good weather all year round. I mean, speaking from a guy who lives in winter for four or five months and can't golf, I don't know why you would do that. Definitely affects my game, but he seems to have found a way with this barn-like uh, practice facility, which was was pretty cool to see. I'm pulling for a guy like Jason Day uh, this week and moving forward. Uh, he was a big time name, you know, not too long ago. Number that one in the world. Was always, yeah, always contention in majors, uh, had a couple setbacks, was battling, and then kind of dropped off and didn't hear from him. And he had some exemptions and he was in tournaments, but never made the cut. And people were like, yeah, maybe it's over for him. But to see his resurgence the last six to 10 months has been great. It'd be a great redemption story if he could pull something off, get another major, or just start by getting a good win. And and why not this week? I think uh, he's got to be a name to consider. Yeah, so with that, we could, we could get into our picks. We're going to be using Bet365 for all of us for the odds, just to keep it across the board. I know, obviously, Nolan's a, across the border. Reed won't be making picks because, as we mentioned, Reed's chasing the professional dream, so we don't need to get him uh, caught up in one of these uh, gambling rings or whatever. I've seen, quick tangent here, these college baseball teams, they've been getting like busted for betting on their own yeah. game, so we don't need yeah. Reed getting into that. The old Pete Rose move. Reed Martin, Pete Rose, two synonymous names uh, yeah at least at least i can go uh, i'd be able to go sell my signature in vegas no one will start with you yeah for my first bet i'm gonna take dash day jason day's son to beat zach pencer <laughs> <laughs> minus Dude, ten thousand. My- <laughs> yeah he could probably wipe the floor with you zach i'm not I'm yeah not. that's not He'd insulting me too. <laughs> i know don't take it that way at all no, but the name like dash wouldn't even me? be close i love the jason day pick and i i'm not gonna change uh, my picks, but that's a that's a perfect you know horse for a course there right now. Um, let's see. I'll jump into Tom Hoagie uh, at plus two ten as a top twenty guy. The dude's a ball striker. The dude is just underrated. Like the definition of underrated man. He just goes around about his business and is knocking off top twenties and getting up in the top ten over here. Now and then you see him uh, have a really good round. And um, I, I think he's a, he's a good ball. He's a great ball striker. I'll say that. Um, so maybe he can get some advantages uh, on the time Tom Weisskopf uh, course where he can maybe get closer than some guys who, you know, will be putting from 25 feet away. So uh, that's what I'm going to go with my first one. Eric Cole is my next pick at a top 40 plus 120. Eric Cole, he has had an interesting year. Um, he's going bouncing back and forth between, uh, let me just read you off his last few starts. Uh, P2, cut. T27, cut. 39th, cut. 5th, cut. Guess what's coming up next? He's making the cut because it's uh, been an off and on. So uh, Eric Cole, top 40 plus money. I love that. And then for my winner, I just like threw a dart on the dartboard here for SH Kim plus 7,500 to win it all. I have no idea. (laughs) 
for winners. Guys, winning on the PGA Tour is so hard to predict. Um, so if one of us gets one here in the next couple of tournaments, I would be ecstatic. Love it. I'm going to give my picks. I love this winner's pick. Adam Scott plus 3,300. I think Adam Scott is like a rich man's KH Lee in how he plays. Not a bomber. Very accurate. Been a very good putter, shockingly, as of late. But going off that, what's better than a rich man's KH Lee? It's just KH Lee. You could get him at uh, plus 275 for a top 10 for a guy who has won this event back to back. I read you look like you're ready to argue that point. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to perform like that so many years in a row, man. I mean, I, I'm not saying it can't happen, but it's just you only you only have so many good weeks in you. You know what I mean? Like unless you're a Tiger at Augusta. Uh, I I kind of like it, but my last pick. This one, this is my favorite bet of the week. It's what I'm going to be putting the most on. Chad Ramey, top 40 at plus 280. Top 40 in a field like this. You got to look at some of the names at the bottom of this list. We got like Davis Love value. playing this event. Value, value. Value, exactly. It's not pretty. We're just trying to win you money. Nothing fun. They're not going to show Chad Ramey on your TV screens, folks. But on the PGA Tour app, you could follow shot by shot as Chad Ramey comes like T33 and you cash that check. So you're welcome in advance. Well, I make my picks before uh, Reed gives his uh, spiel about the courses. And, <laughs> and you pick all bombers. Sometimes, sometimes I'm fist pumping. Sometimes I'm like, oh man, that doesn't, that doesn't add up. But I'm fist pumping today. I think I made some decent picks based off of what Reed was saying. So I'll start with a T20 and that's... Fellow Canadian, Adam Hadwin, top 20 at plus 130. You can get plus 130 money. He's not going to overbomb the ball. He's going to keep it straight. He's going to get it on the green. He's going to try to make some long putts, make some birdies when he can. Uh, as Reed said, just get the ball in the hole in the least amount of strokes. That's Adam Hadwin. That's what he does. Top 20, I think he can sneak in there again, plus 130. Uh, my next guy is one of those players that I kind of was just talking about where maybe they're just using this tournament as a tune-up, getting themselves ready for what's important, and that's the majors. I got Hideki Matsuyama, top 10, plus 275. He has not played since the Masters, okay? We know he's had some injury trouble early on. He had withdrawn one uh, event, but he's made 12 Cuts out of the 14 he's played in. He's trying to ramp up. We know he's probably been golfing. He's come back over to the States. He's ready to go here. Have a good week. Doesn't need to win. Just a good week. Get in that top 10. Win me some money. And then go to the PGA Championship and try to know, try to see if he can get it done. And then my final one, I'm going to pick a winner, and that's Trill Hatton to win the tournament plus 1,600. Uh, is there anything better on a Sunday than sitting down, drinking beers, and watching this guy just be crazy on your TV? So I want him in the mix. I want him on the leaderboard. I, I think he was one of the top three favorites, and we know in these kind of events, Vegas has it right. They know who's going to be there. So is he going to be chasing Scheffler? I hope so. And I hope he's just as crazy and getting in Scheffler's head while he's playing. So I got Terrell Hatton to win it all. That would be very exciting if Terrell Hatton makes a run. One of the more exciting players on tour for sure. I find it interesting. None of us pick Scheffler. Just the odds on massive favorite at this event. No one's taking it. You guys are giving me head nods. Yeah, you can't pick the fit. He's, I mean, like, think we were talking about Tiger Nolan. When Tiger was on his run early on, like, he was almost sometimes minus money to win the tournament. Like, anyone that's below plus a thousand to win the tournament, the value is not there. I mean, he's a, Scheffler's a great golfer, but to say plus 400 to win it, that's not a great return when there's a field of great golfers. And Reed can attest that any one of these guys, okay, maybe not Davis Love at the bottom, but any one of these guys could pop up and have four good days and get 100%. a win. I mean, you never know. Well, fellas, I think we have a great week ahead of us. Hopefully, we can give you guys some winning picks. But before we sign off, I want to go to our trivia master, Reed Martin, to see who's got the best Texas knowledge of the group. Hopefully, for your guys' sake, it's not uh, one of the Canadians, me and Stark, because 
that would really set your country back years. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess we can call you guys cowboys. I mean, they got cowboys in, in Texas that aren't actual cowboys. We have some cowboys players, so. out in Canada. Yeah, yeah. That's not fair, Zach. I mean, I'm way outnumbered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this week they're in McKinney, Texas, which is just outside of Dallas. I got four Dallas trivia questions for you. Um, as we all know, uh, I like to find kind of some interesting stuff. Uh, last week in uh, Puerto Vallarta would have been hard uh, to find some. You know, we all know Puerto Vallarta is just about uh, college spring breaks, and that's about it. Uh, but here we go. These are a couple of these are a little elongated questions, giving you guys some detail in it. But uh, hear me out here. First question. It's going to open answer. Born in Las Vegas in 1988, which athlete started out playing football at the University of Oklahoma, got drafted by the Cowboys, and was named Rookie of the Year in 2011? He spent seven seasons as a running back. Name him. Oh, could I guess first? I feel like I got this. Go. Emmett Smith. Okay, go ahead, Stark, or whoever. Jeez, I, I was going to say Herschel Walker, but I got to be way off on that. I, <laughs> I got it. I, the only guy I could think of was Emmett Smith. I mean, you're talking... Dallas Cowboys. So think, think more recent. Think uh, this guy was a big part of a national championship run in college. Wait, what college did you say he went to? Oklahoma. You know, in Canada, we're not so big in college football. This is Demarco Murray. Oh wow! <laughs> oh wow! Demarco Murray. He was a good. He was good for a while, man. You guys aren't Cowboys fans, I hope. No Maybe negative. <laughs> Bears. Bears beats Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> That's my like <laughs> fantasy football league is like Bears beats fantasy football. Or Dallas question number two at the 2012 Dallas State Fair, which potato chip brand made world record history when it cooked up a 1325 pound chili pie made from its chips? Lay's. Are you looking for a flavor or a brand? Frito Lays. I'll go Miss Vicky. Do you guys have Miss Vicky's there? Yeah, Miss Vicky's are down here. Hi, Miss Vicky's. I'll go. With. I don't even know that many brands. I was just intrigued because it's a 1,325 pound chili pie. That's big. Pringles. Frito Lay was correct. Frito Lay wow. was correct. Hey, he's on the board. Nolan, an elite trivia player. I, you know, Nolan looks like a guy that goes to state yeah. fairs well, all the time. I, mean, I can put in, some chips back. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were going <laughs> to. In Nolan, when he was talking about playing competitive golf, he stated that he was there for the academics. So let's hope that he's a, <laughs> <laughs> he's a trivia guy. What's your go to chip flavor? Salt and vinegar. It's all dress. Oh, Salt and all dress. Canadian all dress are the fucking best. I was dude. just gonna say, yeah. We what about ketchup chips? You guys don't even know about ketchup chips. Ketchup chips, man. I've had those. They're disgusting. Yeah, because Reed's like married to a Canadian. But the the all the all dressed in the U.S. is not the same as the all dressed in no, Canada, dude. It's, it's completely different. It's so good. Dude, uh, my fiance's mom will come down and bring us bags. Oh yeah. Zach, if you want some chips and ketchup, they're two separate items. You can dip the chip and ketchup we don't need to get all crazy and make this all one thing no you got to experience it we got to ship them out to you kettle brand uh honey dijon chips will change your life that's all i'm gonna say hey you wow. guys haven't uh, you guys are years i'm now. a barbecue guy just straight easy barbecue chips so salt good. And vinegar salt and vinegar all right, i got two more questions for you get back to the dallas way here what were the dallas cowboys first called a ropers b saddlers C racers or D steers. I'm gonna go with B saddlers. Um, simply because shout out my mother in law's maiden name is Saddler. Wow, shout out Miss Saddler. I'm gonna go with racers. I feel like uh, that's an event at the uh, Stampedes. They kind of race the horse on the on the buggy thing. I, Again, haven't been to too many Texas State Fairs in my no, day. Very Robert solid Rose. logic. I'm going to have to hear these, uh, these options again here. A, ropers, B, saddlers, C, racers, or D, steers? I'm, I'm going with Stark on this. I'm not one to pick the same thing, but I think racers. I got to inform you guys we're all incorrect. It was D, steers. Oh, wow. That's, that's a terrible team name. <laughs> Yeah, Cowboys is a lot better. <laughs> All right, last one for you. This one might be a little easier, so we might get some uh, points on the board. Dallas has the second second busiest what in the United States? A, bus system, B, airport, 
C freeway system or D mall? The biggest mall is in Minnesota. I want to say St- still yeah. could, it still yeah. could be it still could be the could second. Be the second. Yep. I thought you were gonna give us the option of water park, but that wasn't you, an option. You did say second busiest, right? Yeah. Yes. Why water park? <laughs> I don't know. I just I just feel like in Texas they must have a shit ton of water parks because it's so hot. Okay, so Stark's going E water park. So you're wrong. <laughs> I'm going off the board. No, I you know what you know what I actually think it is? I think it's the um the bus system that you mentioned, the first one, bus transit. I think it's the freeway system. I'm so glad you guys all went that direction because I think I am putting money on it that it is the airport. I like the fact that it could be the bus transit system. That's great. Like that'd be awesome to have. Right. But airport, you know, what's funny is whenever I come up with these questions, I try to think how the, how the hell can I trick them? How can I trick them? And I have, maybe I just know cause I've been there so much, but the airport is absolutely huge and is absolutely massive and has so much traffic that goes through it. The answer is B, airport. Oh, geez. The education guy killing us. Let's go. (laughs) See, I assume number one airport is Atlanta, Georgia, correct? I believe so, yeah. And then I think- My logic was that Dallas would be- it would be too close that they would need a different central hub, but- Dallas Dallas has the second most flights out of it, of any airport in this country. I talked some mad talk during this trivia, and I backed it up, and I feel so good. I'm sorry. You did. <laughs> yeah, it was a big trivia day for you. You started the talk early. You got to send that to your old uh, high school. Dude, I, I mean, Reed stumped me a lot, so this is a great week for an Olin. Hey, we're just talking about the Dallas Steers, baby. Reed, were you like the guy who was up? Like, this was me, to be fair. Anytime I was sick, I would watch, like, the game show network Oh, dude. when I was at home. 10 o'clock, even nowadays, if I'm home, 10 o'clock, it's like, let's make a deal. 11 o'clock's price is right. Uh, Jeopardy and, and Family Feud are on at 7 o'clock. Wheel of Fortune are on at 7.30. <laughs> that's amazing that you know the you know the game show schedule wow you know the time absolutely and then family feuds on all the time so you can watch that whenever the hell you want Family Feud's so great family Feud made like like a board game and it's so fun like, have you yeah, ever have you ever played the game where you it's like christmas time or thanksgiving and you're all together and you look at all your family you've had a few cocktails and you say if we were to go on Family Feud, what five of us would we pick? And the best part is, is everyone's like, oh, it'd be me, it'd be me. But then you got to pick like, uh, you three, you might think you'd be good enough, but you guys would be brutal. We wouldn't even invite you. <laughs> I'd pick Nolan for Play sure. Play that game next holidays. <laughs> I will say the most intriguing game show for me to watch, and it has like seasons of it, and it hasn't been on a little while. LeBron James actually uh, started it or co-founded it. It was called The Wall. Oh, what's that one about? It's where like they drop balls from like it's on this big grid and there's money amounts at the bottom and they have to answer questions and get questions right. And like if you get it wrong, it drops a red ball and you get negative money and green it drops a green. It's it's awesome. Dude. I've seen people win one point five, two million dollars on there and stuff. You see that one Dwayne Wade one, uh the cube or whatever, where they yeah. have like weird random like minute to win it games almost yeah. kind of things yep i love stuff like that i love it dude it's either that or it's id network on my tv i gotta get on one of these shows that's always been a dream to get on one of these reed i would have thought you had said golf channel 24 hours a day I no you know what bro i don't i don't i mean i watch golf especially if it's a bigger event but like i would much rather watch hockey hey love it good answer. seattle crack and making a run well fellas on this week's show We recapped the Wells Fargo with a legendary caddy, Paul Tesori. We discussed the PGA Tour's next stop, the AT&T Byron Nelson, where maybe, just maybe, we're going to see a three-peat. And hopefully, we gave you guys some winning picks along the way. As always, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Bunker Township. And let's have ourselves a week. It's just, that is brutal. Hunter would be an advantage.